I've been reading her work since I first encountered it uh, in the pages of The New Yorker in the mid-1990s. And in three story collections, three novels, Mary Gateskill has gone where not every writer is willing to go, into the darkest and most secret corners of our emotional lives. Her unsentimental observation of how people, and in the case of her newest novel, The Mare, how animals in the world has brought her the attention of loyal readers and the admiration of her peers. She's been nominated for the Penn Faulkner and the National Book Awards and was a finalist for the National Book Critic Award for her most powerful novel, Veronica. Among Mary's many gifts is an amazing ear for how real people talk. The mayor demonstrates this in her beautifully realized characters of Velvet and Ginger, girl and woman separated by class and race and experience, but linked, sometimes desperately, in their search for connections, as are we all. Please welcome Mary Gateskill. Thank you for the introduction. I, and we were just talking before I started how introductions are actually kind of hard to do. People tend to either bury you in effusive, ridiculous praise or say something weird about you. <laughs> so that was great. Um, I, I guess I don't have to explain the book because I'm going to start right pretty much from the beginning. Um, so I'll just jump in. I met her when I was 47, but I felt still young. I looked young, too. This is probably because I had not done many of the things most people that age have done. I'd had no children and no career. I married late, after stumbling through a series of crappy relationships and an intense half-life as an artist visible only in Lower Manhattan, the other half of my life being sloppily given over to alcohol and drugs. I met my husband, Paul, in AA. It was six months before we even had coffee, but I immediately noticed his deep eyes, the animal eloquence of his hairy hands. We eventually moved to a small town upstate, the same town he'd moved from, where he made a good living as a tenured professor at a small college. A lot of his income went to support his wife and daughter, and we lived in an old faculty housing unit long on charm and short on function. Not owning didn't bother us, though. We were comfortable and, for a long time, happy with each other. We went out to eat a lot and traveled in the summer. When people ask me what I did, I sometimes said, I'm transitioning, and very occasionally, I'm a painter. I was embarrassed to say the second thing, even though it was true. I still painted, and it seemed like I was better than I was when I showed at a downtown gallery 20 years before. But I was embarrassed anyway, because I knew I sounded foolish to people who had kids and jobs, and who wouldn't understand my life before I came here. There were a few women who also painted at home whom I was able to talk about it with, describe what art used to be to me and what I wanted to make it be again, a place more real than anything in real life, a place I remember now just dimly, a place of deep joy where, when I could get to it, was like tuning into a radio frequency that was sacred to me, regardless of anything else. Nothing was more important than carrying that frequency on the dial of myself. The problem was, other people created interference. It was hard for me to be close with them and to hear the signal at the same time. I realize that makes me sound strange. I am strange, more than the bare facts of my life would say. But I have slowly come to realize that so many people are strange, that maybe the word is nearly meaningless when applied to human beings. Still, people interfered. And so I created ways to keep them at a distance, including my increasingly expensive habits. 
what I didn't see or allow myself to see was that drugs created even more interference than people. They were a sinister signal all their own, one that enhanced, then blended with, and finally blotted out the original one. When that happened, I got completely lost, and for many years, I didn't even know it. When we moved out of the city, upstate, I began to feel the signal again, but differently. I felt it even when I was with Paul, which did not surprise me. He was not other people. But I began to feel it with other people too, or rather through them, in the density of families living in homes, going back for generations in this town. I would see women with babies in strollers, or with their little kids in the grocery store, and I would feel their rootedness in the place around us and beyond, in the grass and earth, trees and sky. To feel so much through something I was not part of was, of course, lonely. And I began to wonder if it had been a mistake not to have children, to wonder what would have happened if I'd met Paul when I was younger. I don't know, maybe the third time we had sex, he'd said, I want to make you pregnant. I must have had sex hundreds of times before, and men had said all kinds of things to me, but no one had ever said that. I'd never wanted anyone to say it. Girlfriends would tell me a guy had said that, and I would think, how obnoxious. Who do you think you are? Get off of me. But when Paul said it, I heard, I love you. I felt the same. We made love, and I pictured my belly swelling. But that didn't happen. Instead, my sister Melinda died. I know the two things don't go together, but in my mind, they do. My sister lived in Cleveland, Ohio. She'd been sick a long time. She had so many things wrong with her that nobody wanted to think about her, including me. She was a drunk, and she could be mean and crazy, and would call saying fucked up things in the middle of the night. When she was younger, she'd hung around with a sad sack biker gang, and now that she was falling off a cliff, they didn't seem to want to talk to her. I didn't want to talk to her either, but I would, closing my eyes and forcing myself to listen. I would listen until I could remember the feeling of her and me as little girls, drawing pictures together, cuddled on the couch together, eating ice cream out of teacups. Sometimes I couldn't listen and couldn't remember. She'd talk and I'd check my email and wait for her to go away. And then she did. She had a stroke while she was taking a shower. The water was still running on her when they found her a few days later. It was summer, and her body was waterlogged and swollen. Still, I could identify her, even with her thin, tiny mouth, nearly lost in her cheeks and chin, and her brows pulled into an inhuman expression. Paul went with me to clear out her apartment. I hadn't been to visit her for at least a decade, she always preferred to visit me or my mother, and I could see why. Her apartment was filthy, full of old takeout containers, used paper plates and plastic utensils, boxes and bags crammed with the junk she'd been meaning to take out for years. Months worth of unopened mail lay on every surface. There was black mold on the walls. Paul and I stood there in the middle of it and thought, why didn't we help her? The obvious answer was we had helped her. We had sent money. We had flown her out to visit on Christmas. I had talked to her even when I didn't want to. But standing in her apartment, I knew it hadn't been enough. She'd known when I hadn't wanted to talk, which was most of the time. So what good was the money? When the shock was still wearing off, I would go for long walks through the small center of town, out onto country roads, then back into town again. 
I'd look at the women with their children. I'd look into the small, beautiful faces and think of Melinda when she was like that. I'd imagine my mother's warm arms, her unthinking, uncritical limbs that had lifted and held us. There was this one time when our washing machine was broken and I had to go to the laundromat. I was there by myself and this song came on the radio station that the management had on. It's a song that was popular in the 70s about a girl and a horse who both die. I was folding clothes when I recognized it. The singer's voice is thin and fake, but it's pretty. And somewhere in the fakery is the true sadness of smallness and failure and believing in beautiful things that aren't real because that's the only way you're going to get through. Tears came to my eyes. When Melinda was little, she loved horses. For a while, she even rode them. We couldn't afford lessons, so she worked in a stable to earn them. Once I went with our mother to pick Melinda up from there, and I saw her riding in the fenced area beside the stable. She looked so confident and happy, I didn't recognize her. I wondered who that beautiful girl was. So did our mom. She said, look at that one, she... And then stopped short, recognizing her homely daughter. The song said, they say she died one winter when there came a killing frost and the pony she named Wildfire busted down its stall. In the blizzard, she was lost. It was a crap song, <laughs> but it didn't matter. It made me picture my sister before she was broken, coming toward me on a beautiful golden horse. She's coming for me, I know. And on wildfire, we're both going to go. I cried quietly, still folding the clothes. There was nobody there to see me. It was a year later that I started talking about adoption. At first, Paul said, we can't do that at our age. Although he didn't say it, I think he was hurt that I hadn't really tried to have his child but now I wanted some random one. Also, his daughter from his first marriage didn't want to go to school where he teaches, and he'd promised to pay her tuition at Brown after his ex-wife had thrown a big fit about it. Even if money weren't an issue, he didn't think we would have the physical energy for a baby. Well, what about an older child, I asked, like a seven-year-old? But we wouldn't know anything about the kid, he said. They would come fully formed in ways that would be problematic and invisible to us until it was too late. We went back and forth on the subject, not intensely, but persistently, in bed at night and at breakfast. Months went by, spring came, and the dry, frigid winter air went raw and wet, then grew full and soft. Paul's eyes began to be soft when we talked, too. One of his friends told him about an organization that brought poor inner city kids up to stay with country families for a few weeks. The friend suggested it as a way to test the waters, to see what it might be like to have someone else's fully formed child around. We called the organization and they sent us information, including a brochure of white kids and black kids holding flowers and smiling, of white adults hugging black children and a slender black girl touching a woolly white sheep. It was sentimental and flattering to white vanity and manipulative as hell. It was also kind of irresistible. It made you think the beautiful sentiments you pretend to believe in really might be true. That day, I woke up from a dream the way I always woke up, pressed up against my mom's back, my face against her and her turned away, she holding Dante and he holding her, his head between her breasts wrapped around each other like they'd fallen down a hole. It was okay. I was an 11-year-old girl, and I didn't need to have my face in my mama's titty no more. 
that is, if I ever did. Dante, my little brother, was only six. It was summer, and the air conditioner was up too high, dripping dirty water on the floor outside the pan I put there to catch it. Too loud, too. But still, I heard a shout from outside, or maybe a shout from my dream. I was dreaming about my grandfather from DR. He was lost in a dark place like a castle with a lot of rooms and rich white people doing scary things in all of them, and my grandfather somewhere shouting my name. Or maybe it was a shot. I sat up and listened, but there wasn't anything. That day we had to get on a bus and go stay with rich white people for two weeks. We signed up to do this at Puerto Rican Family Services in Williamsburg, even though we are not Puerto Rican, we're Dominican. The social worker walked around in these little high heels, squishing out of tight pants like she thinks she's a model, but with her face frowning like a mask on Halloween. My mom talked to her about how our new neighborhood was all bad neglectus, no Spanish people. She told her how she had to work all day and sometimes at night just to keep a roof over our heads. She said it was going to be summer and I was too old for daycare and because I was stupid, she couldn't trust me to stay inside and not go around the block talking to men. She laughed when she said this, like me talking to men was so stupid it was funny. But I do not go around talking to men. And I told the social worker that with my face. Which made the social worker with her eyes and her mouth tell my mom she shit. Which made me hate her, even if my mom was lying about me. My mom acted like she didn't see what the social worker said with her eyes and mouth, but I knew she did see. She saw like she always does. But she kept talking and smiling with her hard mouth until the social worker handed her a shiny book. She stopped then. I looked to see what had shut my mom up. It was pictures of white people on some grass hugging dark children. Mask face told us we could go stay with people like this for two weeks. It sounds like hell, whispered Dante, but mask face didn't hear that. We could swim and ride bicycles, she said. We could learn about animals. I took the little book out of my mom's hands. It said something about love and having fun. There was a picture of a girl darker than me petting a sheep. There was a picture of a woman with big white legs sitting in a chair with a hat on and a plastic orange flower in her hand, looking like she was waiting for somebody to come and have fun with her. My mom doesn't write, so I filled out the forms. Dante just sat there talking to himself, not caring about anything like always. I didn't want him to come with me, bothering me while I was trying to ride a bicycle or something. So when they asked how he gets along with people, I wrote, he hits them. They asked how he resolves conflict, and I wrote, he hits. It was true anyway. Then my mom asked if we could go to the same family so I could take care of Dante, and Mask Face said, no, it's against the rules. I was glad, and then I felt sorry for saying something bad about Dante for nothing. My mom started to fight about it, and Mask Face said again, it's against the rules. The way she said it was another way of saying your shit, and the smell of that shit was starting to fill up the room. I could feel Dante get small inside. He said, I don't, want, I don't want to go be with those people. He said it so soft you could barely hear him, but my mother said, shut up, you ungrateful boy, you're stupid. The smell got stronger. It covered my mom's head, and she scratched herself like she was trying to get it off. But she couldn't, and so when we left, she hit Dante on the head and called him stupid some more. Going to this place with bicycles and sheeps had been turned into a punishment. Still, I hoped it would be fun. The lady I would stay with had called to talk to me, and she sounded nice. Her voice was little, like she was scared. She said we were going to ride a Ferris wheel at the county fair and swim at the lake and see horses. She didn't sound like the lady with the big legs, but that's how I pictured her, with a plastic flower. I thought of that picture and that voice, and I got excited. I got up and went out into the hall and got into the closet where our coats were. I dug into the back and found my things I keep in the old cotton ball box. I took them out through our living room into the kitchen, 
for it was heavy warm from all the hot days so far. I poured orange juice in my favorite glass with purple flowers on it. I took the juice and my box to the open window and leaned out on the ledge. It was so early there was nobody on the street, except for a raggedy man creeping against a building down below us, holding onto it with one hand like for balance. He was holding the wall where somebody had written Cookie in big red paint. That was because this boy called Cookie used to stand there a lot. He was called that because he ate big cookies all the time. We used to see him in Mr. Nelson's store downstairs and we weren't supposed to talk to him because he was from the project over on Troy Avenue. But I did talk to him and he was nice. Even if he told me once that even though he liked me, if somebody paid him enough, he would kill me. He wouldn't want to because I was gonna grow up fine, but he'd have to. He said it like he was making friends with me. We stood there talking for a while and then he broke off a piece of soft cookie and gave it to Dante. A little while later, a cop killed him for nothing and his name got put on a wall. I took my things out of the box and laid them on the ledge. They look cute together. A silver bell I got from a prize machine, a plastic orange sun I tore off a get well card somebody gave my mom, a blonde keychain doll with only one leg wearing a checkered coat, a dried seahorse from DR that my grandfather sent me, and a blue shell my father gave me when I was a baby and he lived with us. I held the blue shell against my lip to feel how smooth it was. I looked up and saw the sun had put a gold outline on the building across from us. I looked down and saw the ragged man stop against the wall like he was trying to get the strength to breathe. On the street, the ragged man stretched up against the wall, his arms and hands spread out like he was crying on the red paint word. For a second, everything was hard and clear and pounding beautiful. The last time I saw my father, I was almost 10 and Dante was four. We had to leave our old apartment in Williamsburg and my mom was staying with a friend who was trying to find a new place. So he came and took us to Philadelphia in the car with his friend, Manuel. I remember blowing bubbles on the fire escape with his other kids from this woman, Sophia. She had big soft breasts pushed together in a green dress and she made asopao with shrimp and mango pudding. I don't think she liked me so much but her girls were nice. We slept in the same bed and told stories about a disgusting white guy in history who cut people up with a chainsaw and danced around in their skins. And the Lynn, the littlest girl, would rap Missy Elliott like, when I woke up in a piece, I ain't even gotta speak. I'm a bad mamma jamma, god damn it, motherfucker, you ain't gotta like me. It made me and Dante laugh, because she's so cute, she's only four years old. My father sends Dante a card with a dollar in it for his birthday sometimes. Never me. I put down the shell and picked up the seahorse. I never met my grandfather, but he loved me. He talked to me on the phone, and when I sent him my picture, he said I was beautiful. He sent me the seahorse. He said one day my mom would bring me and Dante to visit and he would take us to the ocean. I remember his voice, tired and rough, but mad fun inside. I never saw him and I almost never talked to him on the phone, but when I did, it was like arms around me. Then his voice started to get more tired and the fun was far away in him. He said, I'm always gonna be with you just think of me. I'm there. It scared me. I wanted to say, Grandpa, why are you talking like this? But I was too scared. Even in your dreams, he said, I'm going to be there. I said, bless me, Grandfather. And he did. A month later, he died. 
I put my things back in the box. I looked down in the street. The raggedy man was gone. The gold outline on the building was gone too, spread out through the sky, making it shiny with invisible light. For some reason, I thought of a TV commercial where a million butterflies burst out from some shampoo box or cereal. I thought of Cookie's face when he gave my brother a cookie. I thought of the big legs lady in the booklet holding the fake orange flower, looking like she was hoping for somebody to come and have fun with her. Thank you. Okay, sorry. I don't really know how to feel about Sylvia. Um, what? How, I don't know how to feel about Sylvia, uh, Velvet's mother. Um, how do you feel about her and her relationship with her daughter? Um, how do I feel about her? I actually had a lot of respect for her. I, in, in a strange way, I liked her quite a bit. Um, I felt she's a person in a really difficult situation, obviously. Um, and also she just has a lot of very different ideas of how one is supposed to bring up children. Um, we're, right or wrong, I'm not really sure, we, we in, at least in middle, on the upper middle class side of the population in this country, we tend to think that to physically punish children is always wrong under every circumstance. And physical punishment for children has been, been the norm worldwide for, forever. And it still is in this country for more, more less um, affluent or less educated people, or probably for some affluent people as well. I mean, I don't think it's always about class. Um, it's just become, it's, it's it, like you can't do it in school anymore, and, or it's considered really abuse, and that didn't, that wasn't always true. So she's coming from a place where it's considered actually quite proper and a sign, an, an indication of love to punish children, and she's living in a culture where she's getting utterly confusing I, messages about that, um, and, and, her, and her daughter is getting it too. So I have a lot of um, sympathy for her about that in particular. And also, if I was in her position, I'm not so sure how, how nice I would be. So I, I don't, I think she behaves really badly sometimes, but I actually like her very much in some ways, and it was always my intention that she would be the one that, that would be closest to Velvet finally in the end. I was very happy when I was, re I didn't intend to represent her point of view at first, I intended her just to be seen from the outside because I wasn't at all sure I could represent her point of view. Um, it just kind of came upon me bit by bit. Um, and, I, and I also felt as a reader, I would want to hear her, I would just want to be inside of her head at some point. So I did finally do it, but, but early before I didn't, before I hadn't done that, I gave the book to somebody I know not real well, but she's a, a, a casual friend and she's a single mother so I wanted to know kind of what she thought. I didn't specifically ask her, but I just gave it to her. And I was very gratified when she, first she started out going on about how much she hated Ginger. Uh, <laughs> she was just a, a, an ass and conceited and terrible and ignorant. And then, and I said, well, what did you think about Velvet's mom? And she said, I loved her. <laughs> and I thought, oh, good. <laughs> I'm going in the right direction. At three years old, I was fascinated with horses, and I know there's a lot of people that share that. What is, it, what is the power between that animal and us? Honestly, I don't have a real profound idea of that because I did not, I was not a horse person. I still am not. Um, I got the idea um, in a kind of circuitous way, but I, it, I certainly always thought they were beautiful, um, but they always scared me a little bit. I wasn't somebody who had a natural connection, but I knew my, my sister did. My sister's not the Melinda in the book, but my sister did have a thing for horses, and she did go ride them when she would get some, she would get uh, the lessons by cleaning out the stables. And um, I saw what they did for her. They really transformed her. 
So I, I was aware of that, and I, when I worked with horses, I, it was, I, ha I realized I had to work with horses to write this book, because I, I thought at first I could learn about them by just asking questions or watching people, and I realized that was just not going to happen. I didn't even know enough to ask the right questions. I didn't know what I was looking at when I saw people. So I realized I had to do it, and I thought, well, okay, just maybe 10 lessons or something. Um, and the more I did it, the more I realized I didn't know. And I was actually, was kind of afraid of them. I was 56 years old and realized how bad it would be if I fell off a horse, let alone got thrown off a horse. I did fall off at a certain point. I was lucky I didn't break anything, but um, I was very uncomfortable with them until I got a very strong attachment to this one particular horse, which um, happened because of, I, I put this in the book actually, he, he scared me in particular because a couple of times I, I, I turned him out, I took him out to the pasture a few times and he shoved me with his head. I think honestly it was because I was on the wrong side of him. Um, but it, it, he didn't knock me down, but it scared me. And also one time I was putting him in a, away in a stall and he kind of, I, I didn't know that the people at this barn didn't turn, take him in and turn him around, which you really should do in every case. But with some of the bigger horses, they would just take them to the door of the stall, unclip them and kind of judge, nudge them in. That's what he was expecting. So when I put my elbow into him to merely to remind him of my existence, he took that as the signal to barrel in and basically knock me against the wall. Um, so I was afraid of him and, um, gosh, this is too long a story. <laughs> um, but th th there was a moment where the, the barn wasn't being cared for because the brother um, and the son of the women who worked there was dying. It was a very small operation. so. I came in one day and they weren't there and the stalls were all filthy and the horses had been fed and watered but they hadn't been cleaned. His stall was incredibly gross. And he basically, he was staring at me the whole time I was cleaning out this other horse. I normally wasn't responsible for him but I realized he was asking me to clean his stall. So I went in there even though I was afraid of him and, and I felt it so clearly. I, I actually said to him, I would like to help you out but I'm scared, I don't wanna come in there. And, I really, I, it was the clearest communication I've ever had with an animal. I felt he was saying, he, he knew what I was saying, and he was saying, I'm not interested, I am not gonna hurt you, I need help. <clears throat> um, so I just put some straw or hay in his, his bucket to get him to move away from the door, and then I went in, even though normally it's not a good idea to go right in with the horse if you're gonna clean the stall out, but because I'd had trouble with him with the halter and, and leading him, I, I was just not comfortable to do that. But um, I knew as soon as I walked in, he wasn't gonna hurt me, and he moved out of the way when I asked him, to, I pushed him, and after that, we were, we were golden. Um, I, 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 I would groom him after that, and, and he didn't normally get ridden as a lesson horse. Um, he could be ridden, well, he was not a difficult horse. He was a Tennessee walker, very mild disposition, but he wasn't used to being ridden, really, and he didn't like to be ridden by amateurs or beginners, but Nancy told me he'd really like you to ride him. And he, he, he did. I mean, when I put the saddle pad on him and all that, his lips were trembling. It was like, it was great. I had such a great relationship with him. And that's when I really started to be connecting with horses. And what it is, I don't know how to describe it, except they're, they're so strong and yet they're so gentle and soft. And you feel like that there's just something, even when I was afraid of them, because when I, for a while I didn't ride after I fell. But I would go, I volunteered, and I would go and I would clean stalls and groom them and just do whatever errands around the barn. And I began to realize that even though I still had some residual fear of them, being around them calmed my body. Like the, the anxiety level in my body would just, it would just go down and I would feel really good and peaceful around them. And I also realized they were starting to be comfortable around me because if you're afraid of them, they're very uncomfortable around you. So that's part of the reason I had trouble at first, because that they could tell I was really nervous, and so they were really nervous. But the more I was there and the calmer I got, I began to realize they actually liked me coming in. They knew I would do a really good job on their stalls. They knew I would give them affection, and I enjoyed grooming them. So they actually began to really relax around me, and I just realized I felt good being there. And they have some ability to do that. I don't, I'm sure people have written about it who are better than me, but they're very connecting and you feel a peace around them, even if you're not really a good horse person, that um, 
is quite unique. Um, that, that's a good question. What, what, the question was what initially prompted me to write about it, uh, write about horses. Um, I didn't actually see it as writing about horses. I wanted to write about this girl, but horses became part of it because uh, I did know um, a Latino girl who, a Latina girl who, who loved horses. Um, she wasn't exactly like Velvet, but um, she too, like my sister, she would really transform around horses. They, you could see they uh, gave her a sense of calm and competence that she just didn't get anywhere else. She was not a trusting person and she just completely trusted these animals. Would pretty much want to just spend all of her time around them when she could. Um, and uh, it just happened that I was, I was not at home. I was staying in a boarding house where I was living where I was doing a temporary teaching job and the person who ran the boarding house always had television on. And there was a little film clip of National Velvet, which I had never seen and had no interest in seeing. But it was just the part where Liz Taylor, 15 years old, is riding across the Technicolor Meadow on this beautiful horse. And I just looked at that and thought, there ought to be a, a movie like that about a Latina. And I, I thought, but I couldn't do it. I can't write a screenplay. And at first I thought I could maybe write a treatment and somebody else could write it. So I called my I have a film agent who has just about nothing to do. <laughs> and I said, um, maybe I just think this is a great idea. Maybe I could write a treatment and sell it. And he goes, nobody writes, nobody makes movies based on treatments anymore. Which apparently you used to be able to write what's called a treatment, which is basically a detailed synopsis. And then someone else, if they want, can make a film out of it. But he said, hey, no, one, no one does that anymore. So I said, can I just try? So he said, OK. So I wrote it, 30 pages. He said, well, this is an interesting idea, but I could never sell this. And I said, why not? And he said, because it doesn't know if it wants to be a dark, gritty story or a Walt Disney story. And I said, well, it kind of wants to be both. And he said, well, if you want that, you're going to have to write a YA novel. And I just said, oh, I, I can't do that. And that was back in 2007. And um, it, the, I, I really didn't think I could do it. I thought. I would just make an idiot of myself. I didn't know about horses. I didn't know enough. I didn't think about Latino or Dominican, specifically Dominican culture. Um, and so I kept trying to put it out of my head, but it kept coming back. I've never had that experience before. I would just be sitting there in an airport or grocery shopping or whatever, and suddenly, like a scene would come into my head, or even dialogue. The the last scene or the one of the most dramatic scenes in the book where she rides off on a horse in a fit of temper and gets thrown off came to me back in 2007 when I, in an airport. Um, so because that's never happened to me before, I thought, I have to try this. So finally, 2009, I sat down and wrote 50 pages. I thought, I'll just show it to my editor. If she doesn't like it, that'll be the end of it. If she does like it, then I'll try to write it. And she really liked it, so that's what happened. But I had no idea how hard it would be especially the horse part. I had no idea how hard that would be. Yeah? <laughs> Thanks. There were some things that are a little questionable, but I, I think in fiction you can push the limits of reality a little bit. Th there was a lady behind you who wanted to... Um, I did in that case. I actually had a little date book and I, I wrote it down, but normally it doesn't happen. It's, it's pretty unusual. I think other times it's happened when a, a it, it's happened in the past when a story or book was already in progress and I was thinking consciously about it. What was odd about this is that I, I was not planning to write the book. I was not thinking consciously about it. It would just pop into my head. And that, that had never happened before. So that's what made me think I have to try this. I was just asked to say again that you nailed the um, horse parts. <laughs> you did a fabulous job on the mucking out of the stalls and the feeding and the grooming. So, Well, I did have some help. I actually did have um, horse, a couple of horse people read it, three in fact, 
and I, w I was lucky because uh, I was teaching at NYU during some of that, and one of a student just happened to be in my class who was an Olympic, former Olympic jumper. She now breeds horses, but she was able to really be helpful because um, she was a writer herself, or she was, you know, working on being a writer, and so she was able to, she kind of knew things I would need to know in a way that a regular horse person might simply not think of, but but also I just had people read the manuscript to be sure I hadn't made any particularly egregious mistakes. Um, there, there's a few things that are a little questionable maybe, but like initially I had planned Velvet to win a race and I just realized that wasn't gonna be possible. There's no such thing as a race for girls. I don't know why not, it's not illegal. I, I found that out, it's not illegal in New York, but um, it, it doesn't exist though. I mean, things like uh, hunter paces and fox hunts are equally dangerous, it would seem to me, so I don't know why, but but also a race would be really hard to set up. And also, she would be competing against girls who would just, no matter how talented she was, she couldn't possibly beat them. Um, I meant, Then I thought, okay, it'll be a big show, but at a big show like of the kind I described towards the end of the book, it's the same thing, she couldn't possibly. Um, they would have been girls who would have been started training at six years old and would have the best horses available and would be training constantly and she just, she wouldn't, she couldn't do that. But could she win a couple of, um, a couple of rounds at a sc small schooling show? Yeah, and that would be a big deal for her. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you described as transgressive characters, maybe like Veronica or some of the women in Bad Behavior, and what interests you uh, in writing about them. Um, do you have a specific question about them? Well, I guess, no, it's a general question about characters, you know, who are clearly both have light and darkness in them, and I find them really interesting, and they're not all that written about, especially by women. Um, well, I, the thing, I actually don't use the word transgressive much. Um, I'm not trying to transgress, particularly when I write. I think all fiction transgresses conventions, or if it's good. I mean, all, all literature transgresses conventions because it doesn't take place. It's not that I hate conventions or anything, because conventions can be very useful, um, but, and some people naturally fit them. So I, I'm not always the enemy of convention, always, but, but I think that literature or art of any kind is not meant to live in that world. It's not about that at all. It's, it's meant to create its own forms of being. Convention is really form. And, useful sometimes, uh, and art is about creating completely different forms that have, don't have anything to do with that. It's about the world of people when they dream, when they think horrible thoughts, when they fantasize, um, when they do things they don't want to do, when they uh, imagine things they don't want to do. Um, so I think we all know about that. Like I, I really hate this new thing that's happened where people s only seem to think it's valid to write about likable characters. That's just so absurd to me. I, I can't even understand it. I mean, if you think about Dostoevsky, were they likable? I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, in real life, do I want to hang around likable people or people that I like? Yeah, of course. Why would I want to be around people I don't like? But to me, if I'm writing or reading a book, they're the most interesting characters to me because I wouldn't be around them in real life. I want to know what they like. I want to know what they think about. I want to know why they do the horrible things they do or just the weird things they do. It's really interesting. Why in the world would I only want to read about somebody that I think is likable and that I understand perfectly well? And also, just even the idea, likable, what is that? Like, somebody that I like, someone else might think is an ass. I, I see a lot of people that the people around me think they're really nice and I privately think they're horrible. I just, and and that, that happens all the time. There is no one thing that's always likable. And, and also, why would you want to read about that thing over and over again? I mean, yes, it it's, can be great. I'm not against likable characters. I think it can be great to see somebody who's like a really wonderful, morally great character up against a hideous situation and, and be challenged and threatened and still maintain 
their their being that's that's a wonderful story it's dramatic too but it's also great to see characters who are awful because they often think they don't they don't usually realize they are um, they usually just desperately want something madame bovary um, anna karenina is she nice um, yeah she is she's charming and socially wonderful and you'd probably really like her except she destroys her own life her husband's life vronsky's life um, but she doesn't do it because she's evil she does it because she's a human being Kitty Levin is the good character. She's likable. She's fun to read about, too, but there's a reason the book's not called Kitty Levin. <laughs> you wouldn't want to read it <laughs> and with, without Anna there. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I guess, I guess the women and bad behavior, and I, I don't know. They just seem pretty... I don't know if they're normal. They seem neurotic to me, a lot of them. Like, I, I had to read Bad Behavior... As for an audio book recently, and I found it really uncomfortable to read. I just thought, what's wrong with these girls? <laughs> they're boring, they're whiny. They're, I, I just, I, I felt I was really impatient. And then, not that I don't mean to say you shouldn't like it or to be, but I was surprised at how just neurotic they seemed to me. And I thought, why do people think these girls are so bad? They're not, they're just, they're confused and immature and stumbling around, but that's, that's a lot of people. So that, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, I am really taken with how musical your prose is, and I, I love the way you build scenes around songs. And um, I'm wondering if you could talk about the relationship between um, writing and music for you. Um, well, thank you, for one thing. Um, uh, I don't, um, I, I used to listen to music much more than I do. Partly, I, I actually don't have a good sound system right now. That's part of the reason I don't listen to it so much. But also, I, I was just more tuned into popular music than I am now. Um, I also really love classical music and opera. Um, but not that I'm an aficionado in any way. I just enjoy listening to it. Um, I don't, I, I'm sure there's a connection that, the, that I grew up with music and my family really liked music and we ne nobody ever played an instrument, but there was always music playing and it was a very important part of my psyche. I, I tend to hear music a lot in my head and I love the way it can describe things so fluidly without the particularity of words. It's like it touches on so many things at once and gathers it all up and then it's gone and moves on to something else and thing, different images and feelings flow into, it, into each other. Um, I, I am envious of that as a writer. I, I don't think it's almost impossible, really is impossible to reproduce on the page because in music it happens kind of like that. Um, and then you, know, you have to go through so much to get that effect on the page and then all this laborious going through and by the, end, by the bottom of the page, you're, you're, you've described the two second moment. Um, so uh, that's, that's the best I can do. Although I have to say this too though, I hate the way music is used now. Maybe it's part of why I don't listen to it as much. Um, it, it, the way it's used to, um, I mean this has happened forever, but it's, it's gotten more amplified in the, for commercials or for movies. It's like every two seconds in a many popular movies, there's a new song. I saw a movie, which I, I hope I don't offend anybody, I thought it was one of the worst things I've seen in years, it called Elvis Meets Nixon. I thought I was going to like it. I thought it was going to be f fun, um, but I, I really didn't for a lot of reasons. But the, one of the things I really didn't like about it is, like, every few minutes it seemed there was a, somebody would say a cute thing, and then there was a, a song. And some of the songs were great. I really liked the songs that they picked, um, but it was used to artificially amp up something that really wasn't happening on the screen at all. It was totally borrowing from the power of the music and in an illegitimate way. It just had nothing to do with what was happening on the screen, or Elvis, or, I mean, anything. And I see that a lot in movies, that it also used to kind of co-opt the viewer's feelings. There's a movie that came out maybe 10 years ago called Little Miss Sunshine, which I did love, and part of the reason I did is because it didn't overuse music. Like at the end, the family, if you saw it, and they're pushing their crummy broken car away, and they have to run and then jump onto it, Another, a lesser filmmaker would have made music happen at that moment. 
but they didn't, just silence. And I, I, I thought that was a really good choice. I think music is really overused and used in a really manipulative way now. Thank you. Thank you for coming. This is a great festival.